Hey guys, it's lovely. So, this is my last recording for the new year. It's pretty awesome. It's not going to be posted, uh, you know, before the new year. I'm just kind of... I like to record and then kind of binge post them, I suppose. Um, but, yeah, last post of the new year. And I'm... I mean, well, last recording, right? <laughs> um... I'm just going to continue reading Liberal Fascism by Jonah Goldberg. We are now on the eighth chapter. Two more chapters and we are done with the original edition. And after that, there's going to be more. It's like an afterword, but it, it contains some information. I'm not entirely sure. So I'll read some of it to you guys, possibly. But as of right now, we pretty much are almost at our goal. We just have about a hundred pages left. So, I mean, <laughs> to everyone who actually watched a substantial amount of videos for my liberal fascism reading, thank you very much. I mean, I know I ramble a lot, but just knowing that I have an audience is amazing. And, you know, I might be a small channel right now, but it really, just knowing that people are out there listening to my ideas that means a lot to me so thank you and let's get started oh and before i start actually just know i'm not too well versed on the economy so this is mostly going to be reading i have a few opinions i know basics but honestly i don't really have much of an opinion on the economy so let's start in recent years, liberals have largely succeeded in defining the conventional wisdom when it comes to economics. Corporations are too powerful. They have a stranglehold on the system, the entirety of which is now corrupted by the soil touch of commerce. Every liberal publication in America subscribes to this perspective to some extent, from the nation to the New Republic to the New York Times. The further you move to the left, the more this conviction becomes a caricature. Thus, Bill Maher showed up at the Republican National Convention in 2000, dressed in a NASCAR-style tracksuit, festooned with corporate logos to mock how the Republicans were stooges of Wall Street. Ariana Huffington supposedly switched from right to left due to her disgust with corporate pigs at the trough. William Grider, Kevin Phillips, Robert Reich, Jonathan uh, Kite, and every other would-be Charles Beard on the American left hold similar views. Corporations are inherently right-wing, we are assured, and if left unchecked, these malign and irresponsible entities will bring us perilously close to fascism. Um, I do have an opinion on corporations, of course. I mean, be, me being me, and, you know, all the conspiracies I believe in, and I'm very just, you know, anti-government, anti-elitist, Corporations are very much up there with the elites. I mean, you have to wonder where is the line crossed because, you know, you can start off as a small business and then you can become a big business. Not all corporations are elitist, you know, but um, some are. And that's the problem. I don't see them all as evil. I see them as a necessary part of the economy. Obviously, consumerism is very important and... You know, the more that uh, life passes on, it seems that we're all attached to consumerism through through technology showing us ads and, you know, the ads we see on billboards and on TV and everywhere, really. I mean, everything's a walking billboard. You know, the clothes you wear, walking billboard, the stuff you use. Everyone wants to be trendy. Okay, that's how... That's how most of society functions nowadays. They want to... Well, you know, it's, again, as I've said a lot in this, this book about this collectivist mindset, it is a part of that. People don't want to be the odd one out. They want to fit in. They want to have the coolest new thing. And um, that's how collectivism works with corporations and consumerism. And, you know, I think capitalism is, is great, <laughs> until I start moaning about it. I mean, sometimes I, I kind of, you know, it's just me being me. It's kind of a joke, kind of not. But, 
you know, when holidays come around the corner, I just, it, I mean, their capital is poised. Their capital is poised to make money. And if we fall for it, then that's us. We're that stupid to fall for a capitalist ploy to make more money. And these are just empty gifts. These aren't going to amount to anything. Valentine's Day, a day to celebrate your love. Buy her chocolate, buy her flowers, buy her wine. If you guys love each other, why do you really need this? Sets the mood? N no. No, it doesn't really. At the end of the day, it's gonna be wasted away. Why'd you waste your money? You couldn't have made something better on your own time? No, you fed into the into what the corporations tell you you, you should get, okay? And this is true for any other you know, holiday where you have to, to buy something. When, when did, did Christmas become something where everyone has to get a gift? It's taboo not to even. If you don't give someone that you know a gift, whoa, whoa, you just sinned right there. It's like a capitalist sin not to give someone that you know and love a gift. Why do we have so much of a... Why do we, why do we place so much importance on consumerism? Well, because the corporations tell you to, and they put out ads, and they make you, you know, feel a certain way through pathos and ethos and logos. You know, they, they employ rhetorical tools to drag you in, and you know, they're good at it. They hire people to do this so that they can make more money <laughs> and you can burn it off, all right? I mean, at the end of the day, lots of this stuff is useless. Some of it, meaningful. Most of it, not so much. It's nothing that the, your, the person you're giving it to couldn't have gotten on their own on any other occasion and wouldn't have smiled at. But we, we aggrandize, you know, certain holidays and and certain certain things we we associate these these powerful uh, feelings with so we have to so so we have to get gifts or buy something that we don't really need because we're told uh you know obviously through ads or any other form of uh you know i don't know propaganda you could say um you know, just seeing someone with it too, you know, as I said earlier, just seeing someone with it can influence us. But any any form of that uh, tells us that buying whatever it may be is somehow going to complete us. And it doesn't. It really doesn't. So, I mean, that's how I see corporations. I don't see them as horrible. Again, I think capitalism is good. I think, obviously, it's good for the economy. Um, if they're if they're manipulating us with their ads and whatnot, you know that's that's our fault. Uh, as for corporations that, um, you know, obviously me being the conspiracy theorist, I believe in a lot of wacky shit, and um, you know m me being me, it's just I feel like the government controls so much. But obviously, they're in cahoots with so many things that influence us. Definitely, the corporations are going to influence us. Okay, so I, personally, this is just a random thing that I think can connect to what I'm talking about and how corporations can be evil. Um, I personally believe that uh, someday, who knows when, but someday, they're going to create... A microchip and I mean I mean I watch videos about this kind of shit and I think they already do have something like that but they're going to create a microchip that's gonna give us you know superhuman abilities or some sort of thing it, you know it'll be the latest technology we have to insert this chip into us who knows where but we have to do that and you know they won't force it on us at first they'll they'll make it seem like some hot new technology that uh, everyone has to get and people, being mindless, are going to get it. They're going to put this microchip inside of themselves if that's what's necessary to, when you buy it. And they're going to be completely controlled by the government. But corporations will push it out through ads, okay? And us being consumers who feel like our lives need to be complete with the latest technology will buy it. Not knowing that... This is essentially going to be the downfall of us. This is how they're going to control our minds. 
brainwash us and uh, ultimately result uh, it'll ultimately res result in uh, fascism and that's what we're trying to run away from so that is just one such connection that I feel like if corporations and the government and you know the elitists they all work together and they form these kind of things that are going to hurt the public but um, this is just a conspiracy theory I have no idea if it's true but um, you know be wary if they ever put out something like that. Be wary if they put out something that um, seems too good to be true, because they're going to they're going to make sure to push out all all the ads they can for that for that device. And if it seems sketchy, well, if it seems too perfect, I mean, y y you've got to wonder what's going on. <laughs> so be wary. Just just saying. Uh, the noble fight against these sinister corporate paymasters is part of the eternal struggle to keep fascism, however ill-defined, at bay. Ever since the 1930s, there has been a tendency to see big business, industrialists, economic royalists, or financial ruling classes as the real wizards behind the fascist Oz. Today's liberals are just the latest inheritors of this tradition. On the conspiratorial left, for example, it is de rigueur to call George W. Bush and Republicans in general Nazis. The case is supposedly bolstered by the widely peddled smear that Bush's grandfather was one of the industrialists who funded Hitler. But even outside the fever swamps, the notion that liberals must keep a weather eye on big business for signs of creeping fascism is an article of faith. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. recycles this theme when he writes, The rise of fascism across Europe in the 1930s offers many lessons on how corporate power can undermine a democracy. Mussolini complained that fascism should really be called corporatism. Today, George Bush and his, courts, uh, his court are treating our country as a grab bag for the robber barons. Countless others have echoed these sentiments, arguing in the words of Norman Mailer that America is already a pre-fascist society run by corporations and their lickspittles in the Republican Party. The political scientist Theodore Lowy has said that the Republicans are friendly fascists, a dominant effort to combine government and corporations. The Canadian novelist John Ralston Saul argues in his book the unconscious civilization that we live in a corporatist fascist society, but we are unwilling to see it. Corporate CEOs, Saul laments, are the true descendants of Benito Mussolini. Um, I mean, the arguments they're providing so far, I, I mean, I couldn't really get behind them. It's mostly what I said earlier. That kind of thing is something I could get behind. I don't see corporations as inherently bad. I just see that they can be used for bad, and sometimes it's it could be unwillingly or, you know, knowingly, but not all of them are. It's like how, you know, if you believe in the Illuminati, um, it's not like all musicians are bad, but some of them are. And some of them, you know, they know what they're doing, and that's the bad thing. But likewise, with corporations... Not all of them are bad, but some of them know what they're doing, and some of them might be um, brainwashed into doing it. So that's just how I see it. I don't really... I'm more afraid of the government working with elitists and celebrities and anyone who has major influence. Corporations don't have as much influence, I don't think. Again, as I said, you know, ads and consumerism, that's very important. But how many people are going out of their way to to buy these things just because an ad came out? No, they associate it with somebody else. They associate it with celebrities and influential people, okay? Um, so, you know, you might buy a specific brand of water, but the day that a celebrity comes out promoting it, a, a different one, you're going to go for that one instead. Because, whoa, that water must be really good because, insert your favorite celebrity here, is promoting it. I mean, again, the corporate, the corporations are working with the celebrities and whatnot, but that's, the more, that's more evil than, I would say, government working with just corporations. It would have to be all three, like a trinity. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's the government that is the worst of them all. Okay, so there is much intentional truth to this collective diagnosis, but these would-be physicians have misread both the symptoms and the disease. 
and the left's eternal vigilance to fend off fascism, they have in fact created it, albeit with a friendly face. Like a medieval doctor who believes that mercury will cure madness, they foster precisely the sickness they hope to remedy. Good medicine, like good economics, depends on discarding unproving and proven mythology. Yet for nearly a century, the left and liberals have been using textbooks brimming with superstition. These myths are entwined with one another in a magnificent knot of confusion. Among the strands of this knot are the palpably false notions that big business is inherently right-wing or conservative. And um, I think they have this idea that uh, big business is conservative because, well, um, obviously, first of all, the liberals are trying to hurt them with taxes. I mean, conservatives want to lower those taxes for, for big businesses. Um, Again, I'm not too well versed in economics. I mean, the reasoning behind it seems all right to me. It's like the idea that, you know, you're supposed to tax the rich more because they make more money. They're already paying the majority of the 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 taxes, okay? So it makes no fucking sense. But the reason why they do it for corporations, I think, is so that they can stay here because corporations aren't going to stay here if they're being taxed more and more by uh liberals. They're going to want to go to a place where they can get cheaper labor and be taxed less. So, um, that's, that's the reason, I think. I'm, I'm just, I don't know. If you know, please comment below. But I really don't understand the workings of that. I, you know, I focus more on the, I guess, the identitarian uh, part of, of, um, you know, this whole, my whole, my whole deal is the anti-SJW thing. I mean, I call myself a conservative. Am I really a conservative? You could say it's a sham. <laughs> but I'm honest about it. I'm center, okay? And apparently I'm center-left. But, you know, I just cannot. I cannot go with the label of a liberal. Just cannot. And, you know, I, I have more fun when I'm with conservatives. So it's just, yeah, I feel much more conservative than I do feel liberal. But if we're going to boil down to it, center but you know i'm more into the whole identitarian part of it which is race and class and um gender and sexual orientation that's what i like to talk about because it's very easy to talk about not only that but it's also very interesting to see this sort of um, victim ment victim mentality because i want to be a psychologist and it's interesting to see how groups work. I guess that's also sociology, right? But I just want to see how how these these workings work, how these workings work, how how these groups work, because uh, you know, the way a, these groups work is cult-like to me. So um, it's very interesting, and I want to know why they function that way. But the economy, I mean. What do I care about that? I'm not even old enough to care about that. I don't pay taxes. I don't benefit from anything. I don't have a job. I mean, nothing nothing about the economy matters to me other than the minimum wage. And this is also just really because, um, yeah, I do care about <laughs> prices rising. <laughs> and, um... People don't deserve a $15 minimum wage just because they think they do. I mean, you're doing menial work. And at the same time, if you want to keep your job, just remember when the minimum wage raises, you're going to be displaced if you're not that great. I'm trying to help people keep their jobs, really. I'm supporting, not, by not supporting, uh, a minimum wage of $15. Um, but yeah, I mean, that really has nothing to do with it, I'm just explaining. But yeah, I, the economy, just one of my less important notes when it comes to the whole channel, I suppose, or what I believe in and what I, what I like to learn about, I guess. But, um, man, what was I talking about? Um... Okay, yeah, yeah, big business and conservatism. Um, yeah, obviously, the big businesses aren't going to support liberals if they're taxing them more. And, you know, they already see conservatives as evil, and if they're associating evil with big business as well, then big business is evil, conservatism is evil. If they're both evil, then they must be each other. 
It's like uh, the transitive property, I guess. Uh, kind of stupid, but whatever. And yeah, I think that's all I've got to say about that. I kind of lost my kind of lost my thought. So to continue. European fascism was a tool of big business and that the way to keep business from corrupting government is for government to regulate business to within an inch of its life. In reality, if you define right-wing or conservative in the American sense of supporting the rule of law and the free market, then the more right-wing a business is, the less fascist it becomes. Meanwhile, in terms of economic policy, the more you move to the political center as defined in American politics today, the closer you get to true fascism. If the far left is defined by socialism and the far right by laissez-faire, then it is the mealy-mouthed centrists of the Democratic Leadership Council and the Brookings Institution who are the true fascists, for it is they who subscribe to the notion of the third way, the quintessentially fascistic formulation that claims to be neither left nor right, more important, these myths are often deliberately perpetuated in order to hasten the transformation of American society into precisely the kind of fascist or corporatist nation liberals claim to oppose. To a certain extent, we do live in a fascistic, unconscious civilization, but we've gotten here through the conscious efforts of liberals who want it that way. Cui bono. The notion that fascism was a tool of big business is one of the most persistent and enduring myths of the past century. It has been parroted by Hollywood countless journalists and generations of academics, though not necessarily by historians who specialize in the subject. But as Chesterton said, fallacies do not cease to be fallacies simply because they become fascism, fashions. Doctrinaire Marxism-Leninism defined fascism as the most reactionary and openly terroristic form of the dictatorship of finance capital, established by the imperialistic bourgeoisie to break the resistance of the working class and all the all the progressive elements of society. Trotsky, an admirer of Mussolini's, conceded that fascism was a plebeian movement in origin, but that it was always directed and financed by big capitalist powers. This interpretation was foreordained because by the 1920s, communists were convinced that they were witnessing capitalism's long overdue collapse. Marxist prophecy held that the capitalists would fight back to protect their interests rather than face extinction in the new socialist era. When fascism succeeded in Italy, communist seers simply declared, this is it, at the 4th Congress of the Communist International in 1922. Less than a month after the march on Rome, long before Mussolini consolidated power, the assembled communists settled on this interpretation with little debate over the actual facts on the ground. That the defeated Italian Reds had already spread the rumor that their former comrade had betrayed the movement for his 30 pieces of silver only made the self-serving myth easier to swallow. Convinced that they alone were on the side of the people, the Reds responded to every political defeat by asking, cui bono, who benefits? The answer had to be the ruling capitalists. Fascism thus became a convenient label for desperate capitalists. Ever since, whenever the left has met with political defeat, it has cried, fascism and insisted the fat cats were secretly pulling the strings. Uh, that sounds very familiar. I mean, liberals now, they're calling Trump swin fascist because, well, they lost, right? Get over it, guys. Um, you guys lost, it wasn't because of fascism, especially in a, in a, in a democratic, uh, in a democratic vote. I mean, you know, we can cry corruption all we want. Mm, you never know. But, you guys lost, and, um, you have to deal with it for four years, possibly eight. But, um, no. Just, just no. Stop. Okay? You were not fascist because he won. Okay? And the fact that you want, um, Hillary to win so badly after your whole love Trump's hate spiel. I mean, what the hell? It's just... They're more fascistic in the the reasoning that they think that anyone who voted for Trump must be a horrible, horrible person, and they all lump us into one group. And, you know, in this sense, you know, they're crying fascism, and then, as it says, insisted the fat cats were secretly pulling the strings. I suppose the fat cats in this situation would be the Russians, right? I mean, it, it, it's absurd. I think they just need to get over it. And um, liberals just need to get over their losses as well. I don't see conservatives doing this. Of course, I mean, I've only barely gotten into this. Maybe conservatives are just as bad. But um, but um, until I see them lose, then I'm not really going to care. And I'm going to criticize 
liberals for the time being until I see something that conservatives do that I think would be pretty fucking petty. But yeah, you know, you can't just cry fascism when you don't when you don't win something. It's <laughs> it's like that that book that's a meme now. Everyone I don't like is Hitler. No, stop it and shut up. Um Max Horkheimer, the Frankfurt School of Freud and Marxist, declared that no anti-capitalist theories of fascism could even be entertained. Whoever is not prepared to talk about capitalism should also remain silent about fascism. That that's not how it works, buddy. People can talk about whatever they want. Okay? Okay, buddy? Yeah. Central to all socialist theories of fascism, writes the historian Martin Kitchen, is the insistence on the close relationship between fascism and industry. Yale's? Oh my oh my gosh, it's Yale. Ah! Okay, shout out to Yale because that's where I want to go. Anytime, anytime Yale is mentioned in anything, I mean, I, I've got to make a shout out, even though I'm not there yet. <laughs> Hopefully I am getting in. We will know by next year. Okay, this is a new year. We're getting in, baby. Okay? <laughs> so, Yale's Henry Ashby Turner, Turner calls this an ideological straitjacket that constrains virtually all Marxist-influenced scholarship. Almost without exception, these writings suffer, as do, one of, uh, as do those of Orthodox Marxists, from over-reliance on questionable, if not fraudulent, scholarship, and from egregious misrepresentations of factual information. In point of fact, there is zero evidence that Mussolini was the pawn of monolithic big capitalism. Far from being uniformly supportive of fascism, big business was bitterly divided right up until Mussolini seized power. Fascist intellectuals, moreover, moreover were openly contemptuous of capitalism and laissez-faire economics. The socialist mythology became even cruder in response to Nazism. Hitler's success horrified the communists, though not because the communists were delicate little flowers. Nazi tactics in the 1920s were no more barbaric than communist tactics. What terrified the Reds was the fact that the Browns were beating them at their own game. Like Macy's bad-mouthing gimbals, the Bolsheviks and their sympathizers mounted a desperate campaign to discredit Nazism. Marx's prophecy, it turned out, also made for good propaganda. Stalin personally issued orders never to use the word socialist when referring to fascists, even when fascists routinely identified themselves as socialists, and later, under the doctrine of social fascism, instructed followers to dub all competing progressive and socialist ideologies fascist. Meanwhile, the left-wing press in Germany and throughout the West became a transmission belt for one bogus rumor after another that German industrialists were bankrolling the mad corporal and his brown shirts. The success of this propaganda effort remains the chief reason liberals continue to link capitalism and Nazism, big business and fascism. This is all nonsense, as we've seen. The National Socialist German Workers' Party was in every respect a grassroots populist party. Party leaders spouted all sorts of socialist prattle about seizing the wealth of the rich. Mein Kampf is replete with attacks on dividend hungry businessmen whose greed, ruthlessness, and short sighted narrow mindedness were ruining the country. Hitler adamantly took the side of the trade union movement over dishonorable employers. In 1941, he was still calling big businessmen rogues and cold-blooded money grubbers, who were constantly complaining about not getting their way. When the left charged that Hitler was being funded by the capitalists, he responded that these were nothing but filthy lies. In particular, German leftists claimed that the capitalist icon Hugo Stins was Hitler's secret patron, a charge for which there is still no evidence. Hitler exploded in rage at the suggestion. After all, he demonized Stins in speeches and articles for quite some time. Stins believed that economic improvement and not political revolution should solve Germany's woes, a view that Hitler considered sacrilegious. It's uh, also important to recognize that while Hitler was first among equals in the Nazi party in the 1920s, his comrades spoke for the movement as well, and the rank and file radicals of the old fighters were resolutely anti-big business populists. Upon seizing power, the radicals in the Nazi party labor union th threatened to put business leaders in concentration camps if they didn't increase workers' wages. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, at least that's not going on today, but imagine... <laughs> We're we're not raising the minimum wage to the concentration to the concentration camps you go. What the hell? And I guarantee you that was probably a time when, when people could um 
you know, choose choose how much they were going to pay their their employees based on the on the work they were doing rather than just you get this much you get this much and you get this much and we don't really care for breaking the law i mean it was probably legal to pay your to pay your employer to pay your employee a certain amount um and the government wasn't supposed to tell you to go to a fucking concentration camp wow um, that is hardly the sort of thing one would expect from a party secretly on the take from big business all along. Oh yeah, definitely. But, you know, I think liberals like to rewrite history in the way that they want it to. Everyone likes to rewrite history. They want everything to benefit them, so not surprising, but kind of disheartening. According to Henry Ashby Turner's definitive scholarship, throughout the 1920s, the Nazis received virtually no significant support from German or foreign industrialists. Some successful professionals, merchants, and small businessmen did not give nominal support, but that was usually driven by non-economic concerns such as rank, anti-Semitism, and populist rage. The Nazis made most of their money from membership dues and small contributions. Much of the rest came from selling the 1920s equivalent of bumper stickers and t-shirts. The Nazis hawked brown shirts and nationalist socialist flags. They also endorsed products such as cigarettes, despite Hitler's hatred of them, and even margarine. Wow. Yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would think that Hitler would hate cigarettes. He tried to make Germany really healthy. See, another good thing that Hitler did. <laughs> I mean, some of his policies, like, you know, his health policies and all of that, trying to make people more athletic in Germany, that's good. That's honestly really good. And you gotta love someone who hates cigarettes. They, I, I think it said it earlier in the book, but they, but they, the Germans, they um, basically discovered that smoking was bad for you. So yeah, he should definitely hate it. Man, I hate cigarettes too. Hitler loves me. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. They charged admission to rallies, which were really youth happenings. The foreign media also paid for interviews with Hitler. Compared to the sustained intake of money raised by membership dues and other contributions of the Nazi rank and file, Turner explains, uh, the funds that reach the party from the side of big business assume at best a marginal significance. When Hitler did raise small amounts from wealthy donors, the motivations for such support more often had to do with radical chic than with preserving the capitalist system. Edwin Beckstein and Hugo Bruckman are often cited as wealthy supporters of Nazism. But they only met Hitler through their wives, Helen and Elsa. Whoa, whoa. Elsa from, from fucking Frozen? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh... Through their wives, Helen and Elsa, both women were middle-aged, established members of Munich High Society, and while they jealously competed with each other, they shared a common love for uh, Wagnerian opera, and were united by their crushes on the fiery radical who would titillate the patrons of their respective salons by hanging his holstered gun and bullwhip on the contra coat rack before entering and expounding on everything from Wagner to Bolshevism to the Jews. Shit, I'd be in love too. Oh my gosh, he sounds hot. Are they talking about Hitler? Because... Fuck. I, I did hear that Hitler likes uh, Wagner, and I, I, I like Wagner, so, you know. <laughs> ah, Richard Wagner. Okay. <laughs> uh, both women were incensed when rumors circulated that Hitler's whip was a gift from the other woman. <laughs> wow. So they are talking about Hitler. Hitler sounds sexy as hell right now. I always knew I wanted a fine Aryan man. <laughs> um, the reality was that Hitler had received bullwhips from both women and let each believe that he only carried hers. Oh, oh, Hitler, you're such a player. Wow. <laughs> such scenes were more reminiscent of Tom Wolfe's account of Leonard Bernstein's fundraising party for the Black Panthers than of some star chamber where the scions of international capitalism schemed to use Hitler as a swore to beat back the Red Menace. Eventually, the husbands of, um, offered the wives' pet project some money, but not very much. Hitler still had to ride to many appearances in the back of an old pickup truck. The Fascist Bargain Many liberals are correct when they bemoan the collusion of government and corporations. They even have a point when they decry special deals for 
Halliburton or Archer Daniels Midland is proof of creeping fascism, what they misunderstand completely is that this is the system they set up. This is the system they want. This is the system they mobilize and march for. Debates about economics these days generally enjoy a climate of bipartisan asininity. Asininity. Democrats want to rein in corporations while Republicans claim to be pro-business. The, pro the problem is that being pro-business is hardly the same thing as being pro-free market. While reining in corporations breeds precisely the climate liberals decry as fascistic. The fascist bargain goes something like this. The state says to the industrialists, you may stay in business and own your factories in the spirit of cooperation and unity. We will even guarantee you profits and a lack of serious competition. In exchange, we expect you to agree with and help implement our political agenda. The moral and economic content of the agenda depends on the nature of the regime. The left looked at German businesses' support for the Nazi war machine and leaped to the conclusion that business always supports war. And I don't see why. That doesn't really make any sense. Um... I guess during wartime, you can either, okay, during wartime, you're either going to have an economic high or an economic low, um, because people are either going to have a lot of morale or they're going to have low morale. If they have a lot of morale, they're going to support the war, they're going to buy stuff for the war, they're going to do anything they can to make sure production is still working well. Our boys in, our boy, I don't know, what what's the color, <laughs> our boys in green? Make sure our boys in green are... <laughs> Are out there safe okay they're gonna make sure everything is in tip-top shape while people are out fighting a war for their country you know it's it's nationalism it's it's patriotism and um, this feeling that uh, everyone is united that's like you know I guess the upside of collectivism so in that sense people are going to have um, a good economy and of course the businesses are going to support war, but then if it's a low morale, who's going to want to do anything? Who's going to buy things? Who's going to, I mean, things are going to be rationed maybe. And then the economy is just kind of like low and there's depression literally and figuratively. So in that case, why would you even support war if, if no one's happy? You'd want to support something else that might get people to buy things. So, I mean, I don't think it's an inherently, it's, I don't think business would inherently support war. Um, they did the same with American business after World War One, arguing that because arms manufacturers benefited from the war, the armaments industry was therefore responsible for it. W wow. Okay. That makes, that makes zero sense just because, you know, in World War One, arms were being made obviously, and people were purchasing them for the soldiers and whatnot. Um, that doesn't mean that the armaments industry caused the war. That's fucking stupid. If a war starts and, and everyone starts buying knives, I don't know, because that's their preferred weapon, are, are we gonna, uh, are we gonna, like, say that the knife industry was responsible for it? No, not really. Just because there's a spike in what people are buying because of a certain event doesn't mean that industry caused it. Alright? Alright, so it's fine to say that incestuous relationships between corporations and governments are fascistic. The problem comes when you claim that such arrangements are inherently right-wing. And yeah, that's the problem. If anything, I think they're from both sides, as I said earlier. I mean, that's, that's some corrupt shit right there when governments and corporations and then obviously influential people, that, that trinity that I described earlier, when they all come together, that's corruption. Oh, definitely. And um, it's not an inherently right-wing thing. It can be anybody from the political spectrum. And I would say it's both. If the collusion of big business and government is right-wing, then FDR was a right-winger. If corporatism and propagandistic militarism are fascist, then Woodrow Wilson was a fascist, and so were the New Dealers. If you understand the, the right-wing or conservative position to be that of those who argue for free markets, competition, property rights, and the other political values inscribed in the original intent of the American Founding Fathers, then big business is fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, and New Deal America was not right-wing. It was left-wing, and it was fascistic. What's more, it still is.
Since the dawn of the Progressive Era, reformers have constructed an army of straw men conjured a maelstrom of myths to justify blurring the lines between business and government. According to civics textbooks, uh, Upton Sinclair and his fellow muckrackers unleashed populist rage against the cruel excessive of the meatpacking industry, and as a result, Teddy Roosevelt and his fellow progressives boldly reigned in an industry run amok. The same story repeats itself for the accomplishments of other muckrackers, including the, per uh, the pro-Mussolini icons Ida Tarbell and Lincoln Steffens. This narrative lives on as generations of journalism students dream of exposing corporate mal- uh, malfeasance, and promoting government-imposed reform. The problem is that it's totally untrue. In fact, Sinclair freely acknowledged the federal inspection of meat was historically established at the Packers' request. Sinclair wrote in 1906, It is maintained and paid for by the people of the United States for the benefit of the Packers. The historian Gabriel Colco concurs, The reality of the matter, of course, is that the big Packers were warm friends of regulation, especially when it primarily affected their innumerable small competitors. A spokesman for big meat, as we might call it today, told Congress, We are now and have always been in favor of the extension of the inspection, also to the adoption of the sanitary regulations that will ensure the very best possible conditions. The meatpacking conglomerates knew that federal inspection would become a marketing tool for their products and, eventually, a minimum standard. Small firms and butchers who'd earned the trust of consumers would be forced to endure onerous compliance costs, while large firms... Uh, large firms not only could observe the cost more easily, but would be able to claim their products were superior to uncertified meats. This story plays itself out again and again during the Progressive Era. The infamous steel industry heirs to the 19th century robber barons embraced government intervention on a massive scale. The familiar fairy tale is that the government stepped in to control predatory monopolies. The truth is almost exactly the opposite. The big steel firms were terrified that the that uh, free competition would undermine their predatory monopolies, so they asked the government to intervene and the government happily obliged. U.S. Steel, which was the product of 138 merged steel firms, was stunned to see its profits decline in the, in the face of stiff competition. In response, Chairman of U.S. Steel, Judge Albert Gray, convened a meeting of leading steel companies at the War Waldorf Astoria in 1907 with the aim of forming a gentleman's agreement to fix prices. Representatives of Teddy Roosevelt's Justice Department attended the meetings. Nonetheless, the agreements didn't work as some firms couldn't be trusted not to undersell others. Having failed in the realm of economics, Colco observes the efforts of the United States Steel Group were to be shifted to politics. By 1909, the steel tycoon Andrew Carnegie was writing in the New York Times in favor of government control of the steel industry. And I actually just recently read about Andrew Carnegie in my um, history textbook, so he was like a millionaire. He had a lot of, he had a lot of influence, and I mean... You know, he was one of these people that, with his money, he was able to buy off people in Congress, you know, bribe them to enact laws that would benefit him, give him more money and power. So, uh, you know, he, that was truly corruption. People, when people started realizing that these multimillionaires and, you know, in the case of J.P. Morgan, billionaire, when they realized these people had that much power, they became very, very wary of um, the government and their ties to these influential and, um, you know, rich and powerful business people. So, I mean, that's worth noting. In June 1911, Judge Gary told Congress, I believe we must come to enforce publicity, socialization, and government control, even as to prices. Um, definitely not. I mean, yeah, I support laissez-faire <laughs> to a certain extent, as I've explained before. And, um, definitely, no, you can't do that. I mean, government shouldn't even be in business like that. Like, if you're trying to do some sort of human rights regulation, can't treat your employers a certain way, fine. Government can be in that. And, yeah, obviously we don't want to pay people one cent for their work. So, okay, government can also regulate that to a certain extent. I mean, when it comes to the minimum wage, I think there should just be a cutoff point. And if it's if someone feels like their work is worth something more, then they can, I don't know, file a complaint. I don't know. I mean, I'm acting as if this is so easy. It's probably not. But that just seems like a, an, you know, something that's quite logical, but whatever. Anyhow, government intervention should be very, very minimal in business, and um, they shouldn't control prices. 
and as for enforced publicity, we must come to enforced publicity and government control. I mean, what do you mean by enforced publicity? Do they mean they're going to to regulate what ads come out from businesses too, what the ads can say and all of that? Because then that's censorship too. So, I mean, that's very fascistic. <laughs> One need only look at Herbert Crowley's Promise of American Life to see how fundamentally fascistic progressive economics were. Crowley was contemptuous of competition. Trust-busting was a fool's errand. If a corporation got so big that it became a monopoly, Crowley didn't believe it should be broken, broken up. Rather, it should be nationalized, which I guess that means government would take over it. Uh, big business contributed enormously to American economic efficiency, he explained. Corporation was Crowley's watchword. It should be the effort in all civ of all civilized societies to substitute corp cooperation for competitive methods. As a philosophical and practical matter, Crowley opposed the very conception of the neutral rule of law for business, since all legislation was ultimately aimed at uh, discriminating against one interest or another, a view revived by critical legal theorists more than a century later. The state would abandon the trade of neutrality and instead embrace a national program that put the good of the collective ahead of the individual. And again, it says pro-collectivism pro versus, um, you know, pro-individualism. Again, I'm very pro-individualist. So, you know, yeah, you can say you're trying to benefit the collective, but you're not really trying to, especially in this context. You're just trying to benefit your freaking industry and your, your corporation and your personal business and, you know, ultimately, yourself. You're not looking out for the benefit of everyone. You're looking out for yourself. So you can you can mask it up with loaded words, but we all know what you're going for. Um, most of us at least. But it's just it's loaded words to make people think, oh, he really cares about the people. No, he doesn't. As we've seen, World War I offered a golden opportunity for Crowley's agenda, big business, and the Wilson administration formed the Council of National Defense, or CND, according to Wilson, for the purpose of redesigning the whole industrial mecha uh, mechanism in the most effective way. It is our hope, Hudson uh, Motor Car Company, as Howard Coffin explained in a letter to the DuPonts, that we may lay the foundation for that closely knit structure, industrial, civil, and military, which every thinking American has come to realize is vital to the future life of this country. In peace, and in commerce, no less than in possible war. So, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it right here. This, I don't think, I mean, I'm kind of reading ahead with my eyes, but the rest I don't think I have much of a, an opinion on, and I may be on the ninth chapter the next time I read this, only because I'm going to a New Year's Eve party tonight, and um, I'm bored as hell there. I'm always bored when I go there, so I don't have anything to do but uh, do my homework and read and lots of other things that are um, academic or scholarly, as you would say. So, you know, I'll leave it right here, and if you have any questions for me that um, you think I could answer or anything you think I should be interested in, and as always, I am looking for book recommendations. I may not get to them, I really don't have time because of school, but if you have any book recommendations, I would be pleased, I would be so pleased to see them, and I will add them to my list, and maybe your recommendation is so great that I will put it at the top of my list, and I will read it, and maybe it'll be on here, but, um, yeah, you know, book recommendations, questions, comments, criticism, anything... Put it in the comments, I guess. And, um, yeah, that's all I've got to say for now. I know it's not going to be New Year's when I post this, but, um, I hope everyone had a great, hope everyone had a great New Year's. And, more so, I hope everyone had a great self-reflection of 2016 and what they can do better for the next year. I know people think, um, 2016 was a very, very horrible year, possibly the worst of course, you should go and uh, look at uh, Paul Joseph Watson's video about about uh, claiming that 2016 was the worst year. Um, I think people just were very... I guess they had low morale. They weren't feeling up to it this year. And I completely understand that. In retrospect, I don't think this was such a horrible year. I think it was pretty fucking long. 
surprisingly. But um, it was a it was a good year. It was all right. I'm fine. I'm healthy. I'm alive. I'm happy. And I mean, I've been having so much fun doing all of this YouTube stuff. So this has definitely been quite the pleasure for me. I really enjoy doing it and I really enjoy having an audience and interacting with people on Twitter and you know making lots of internet friends. I've made quite a few this year and um I was quite surprised but you know I'm not I'm not really talkative. I I usually don't approach people. I think I did for one person that is now my friend. But for the most part I was really really surprised when people, you know, approached me and you know mentioned me on Twitter and stuff like that and I was really really happy about it and it's actually helped me in real life it's made me more of a social person surprisingly you know they say the internet's gonna make everyone less social but um, it really didn't for me it's actually helped me a lot I, I struggle with um, talking to people normally I mean I'm quite an awkward person I get so much anxiety just you know anywhere I I overanalyze what's going on I think about how someone else is perceiving me even I mean in the long run after I do it I'm like well no one cares and I guess I shouldn't care but when it's going on it's like the whole world is rushing around me and that's lessened to a certain extent and I really appreciate that because I've had the opportunity to help lessen that through YouTube and um I hope I can make more videos for you guys and please <laughs> for everyone who subscribed to me continue to be subscribed to me and we will make this we will make it through my journey and once i am accepted to my beloved yale we can all celebrate and i will uh i will do a face reveal yeah i i was going to do it when i was 18 but i think i'm going to set the barrier for if i get accepted to yale if i get accepted to yale i will show my face much earlier than 18, but if I don't, you guys will have to wait, okay? <laughs> so, thank you very much for, uh, for listening, and, um, again, have a, have a great new year, or 2017 now, I guess. I hope your self-reflection was good, keep strong with your resolutions, do not lose sight, and, um, yeah, thanks, thank you, and bye.